Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, after the last video, the one where I looked at Walter's world and he talked about Ohio, a bunch of you were saying, you need to do the same thing for the UK, for England, for something like that. So I thought I would dive into one more before we get back to some regular history content. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at his video. This one's from a while ago, but it's the don'ts of visiting England. Now, granted, I am not from the UK, so I can't speak to this firsthand like I could with the ones about Ohio, but I've been there twice and it's a place that I have a lot of love for, I'm a long time Anglophile. Uh, so I'll be interested to see if what he describes match the experience that I've had in my two trips uh, over there. Uh, and now granted, there's a lot of places I haven't been yet. I've been to London, uh, I've been to Windsor, I've been to York, I've been to Birmingham and some of the areas in the West Midlands, West Brom, Tipton, things like that. But otherwise, I haven't been to a lot of places in England yet. So I recognize that London and England are not always the same thing. London is very specific. It's like visiting New York City versus visiting Ohio here in the States. Different experience. But as always, the link is in the description and we'll have a little fun with this. Let's dive in. Hey there fellow travelers, Mark here with Walter's World and today we are back in England for the things you don't want to do when you come to England. Now the first don't I have for you is don't worry if you don't understand the English. You may have spoken English or you thought you spoke English since birth. You may think you're a native speaker, but don't be surprised if sometimes you might not understand people here in England because they do have various accents, but also some of the colloquialisms and sayings and phrases they do use here sometimes can throw you off thinking, oh wait, is he trying to be mean to me or is that a joke? I'm not sure. You know, and the humor. Funny thing is I haven't heard most of those when I've been over there. Um, but I would say, at least for me personally, I didn't have any trouble with uh, people's accents in England. Scotland, a little different story. I'm mostly deaf in my right ear, so a lot of times I have to read people's lips to understand them, especially if there's a lot of other noise going on, if we're in a crowded room or things like that. And of course, masks made that really hard, but um, I didn't have any trouble in England. Now, granted, in London, you'll be surprised. A lot of people aren't speaking English in London. London's a very multicultural, very multilingual place because you have a lot of people visiting, you have a lot of people who have immigrated there. Uh, so I was actually surprised how often people were speaking languages other than English when I was in London. But yeah, in uh, Scotland, I had a little bit of trouble. But just like in most places, there are varying accents, right? The way people talk in London, I think is a little easier to understand than way, the way people talk, say, in Newcastle, which the, they have this what's called the Geordie accent. Uh, or in Birmingham, the West Midlands, they have the Brummy accent, which I hear most people describe as the worst accent in England. Over here can be very different, so don't worry if you don't understand the English. The second don't, don't be scared of the food. Now, don't expect to have a culinary masterpiece every day here, but don't be scared to try the food. I know a lot of people talk about England and it's kind of like, oh, there's cool sights in the countryside, da da da, but the food, oh my God. Look, I've been coming to England for about 20 years now, and I actually have seen the food getting better. There's tons of international food, there's tons of different restaurants throughout the country. But the thing is, the traditional English food can be pretty fun. If you go to a pub and you have you know, your steak and kidney pie, or your shepherd's pie, or you go for a Sunday roast, I mean, it's Sunday tomorrow, and I'm kind of excited to hit the pub to have a Sunday roast with Yorkshire pudding, you'll be... <laughs> so, I'll say a couple things about the food before, you, well, let me finish, let him finish. Be surprised first. that you might actually like the food here, so don't be scared about the food, okay? It can work out just fine. So, um, I'm not a foodie. Uh, my wife is really into food and things like that, and she loved the food in the UK, both in England and in Scotland. She tried all the different things. My son, my, my now 15-year-old son, absolutely loved fish and chips and ate it a bunch of times. My younger son and myself, we really loved, there's an Italian chain restaurant in the UK called Ask Italia. Uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think our whole family really liked it. We had it in York and we had it again in Glasgow. Uh, and so it was really good. But yeah, I, I thought the food was good in the UK. Uh, no complaints at all. One thing I will warn you about, if you're an American, don't expect ice with your drinks. That is something, even if you ask for it, you'll get like one or two cubes. That was driving my wife nuts. Now, it doesn't bother me. I don't care about ice. But ice is not a normal thing that they do. They don't bring you a big cup full of ice with your drinks like you might be used to here in the States. 
Now the third don't I have for you is don't just stay in hotels. One of the quintessential parts of coming to England and driving around England and going through England is to stay in the B&Bs, the bed and breakfasts. Yeah. Because they have a whole network of B&Bs throughout the countries in big city, in, in small towns, in villages out in the countryside. And it really is a quintessential part of visiting England. Because what's cool is you're staying with a family and they're gonna talk to you, they're gonna give you the tourist information, they're gonna give you the stories, the history. You're in their home and you see, wow, so this is how English people live this is how things are and it gives you this cool idea and that's one thing I really want to say is look you're not staying at Ibis all the time okay go stay in a and b so you can really get a feel of the place and one of the really best parts you're going to some of these smaller towns and stuff like that stay in the B&Bs sometimes your only option but it's definitely the best option when you're here and also to tie it in with the second thing about the food Usually you get a full English breakfast with it, yeah. you know, with the with the, you know, the the black sausage, the black sausage and the bangers, the normal sausage and the beans and the toast and the eggs and the fried tomatoes and mushrooms and all those things, and it just feels like a really special experience. So yeah, we we stayed in a hotel in London, and be prepared if you if you want a decently priced hotel in London that's in a good location, it's gonna be really tiny. We were in a room that was maybe twelve by. Tw 12 by 15 for all five of us. We had five beds <laughs> in this like 12 by 15 room and then a bathroom and that was all you had. When I just stayed the last time in London, I was right by King's Cross Station because I wanted that good location. And for like $120 a night, uh, I was staying in a room that was basically the size of the bathroom that I had when I was in Bastogne a few days later. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is with London. But yeah, we stayed at an Airbnb in York, uh, which was a three-story Airbnb right on the shambles. What an amazing location. And we definitely want to go back to York and we want to stay in that same spot because it had a full kitchen. It was great. We also stayed at an Airbnb in Edinburgh, right on the Royal Mile, right by Holyrood Palace. And that was also really, really cool. Great locations. It's a great vibe. It's a cool kind of experience, especially if you're staying somewhere for more than a couple of days. And then we also had an, uh, a bed and breakfast, not an Airbnb, but a traditional, like a hotel bed and breakfast. Uh, in Portree on the Isle of Skye with the full breakfast, fantastic, loved it. And that was very, very reasonably priced. Now the fourth don't we have is don't be scared to drive. I know they drive on the left hand side Haven't of the road here, which can be a little confusing or off putting for travelers when they come here. But the thing is, public transport is really kind of expensive here. Taking the train throughout the country, oh my god, it is expensive. So you're going to want to rent a car because you can get to all these little tiny villages and see the stately homes and you know that Downton Abbey stuff you want to see. You can go and see those things with your own car. So don't be afraid to rent a car here. However, I will warn you, when you first drive driving on the other side of the road, it is a bit, you know, off-putting. You're like, oh my, am I going the And it's not just the other side of the road, you're on the other side of the car too, because the steering wheel's on the right side. I haven't done it yet. I've driven in Europe, like in France, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany. Uh, haven't gone to the UK yet and rented a car just because of the whole, not ready for that. Public transportation's great in Europe as a whole, but especially in the UK. I've been able to use public transportation, mostly trains, but also buses to get everywhere I needed to go. But there are some places you're only gonna be able to get with a car. I haven't done it yet, but I'm told once you get through your first roundabout, it's not bad, especially probably out in the country, it's not bad. The problem is that the roads are also very narrow in Europe. Uh, so that's an extra kind of added thing that makes me a little nervous about it. But I will say this, when renting a car, not only in the UK, but anywhere in Europe, if you're an American and you're used to having an automatic, make sure you specify that if you don't know how to drive a standard, a stick shift, because that's what most cars are there. So you're gonna need to be prepared for that. And you will probably play, pay a little bit extra for an automatic car. The right way. And then when you hit your first roundabout, <sighs> Good luck, my friends. That's what people tell Good me. Luck. But don't be scared to drive because you want to drive throughout this country. And if you are going to be driving, I do recommend getting the GPS for you because when you're driving the other side of the Use road, you're going to be so concentrated on that that sometimes you'll miss the turn off. I recognize he's making this video before using your phone for GPS became kind of the standard thing to do. Some stuff and with all the roundabouts and everything, GPS just a lot easier to deal with. I'll just tell you that one right now. Another thing that kind of deals with that other side of the road driving is don't forget to look right when you cross the street. Look, and they do. They literally have these signs everywhere. 
when you're walking, especially in a big city like London, they'll have signs that say look right or look left, depending on if you're in the middle or on, you know, what side of the road you're on. They're driving on the left side of the road, so the cars come from the right, not the left. And I can't tell you, I've been in York, I've been here in London, I've been in Cambridge, Brighton, throughout all, most of the districts around this country, and tourists from everywhere in Europe and everywhere around in the U.S., they come walking in and they look left, and the car is coming this way, and it's like, beep, beep, oh my god! and you have that almost death-defying, or a death-inducing moment. So don't forget to look right when you cross the street. Remember, it's right, left, right, because the cars are coming from that way, because they drive on the left hand here, left hand side. So please, don't get killed, okay? So don't forget to look right. Now the sixth don't we have for you is, don't think that London is England. London True. is a great city, it's an international city, but it's not all what England is. It's like saying, I went to New York, so I saw America. No, it's not like that. Or I went to Berlin and I saw true Germany. No, Berlin, New York, London, they're very cosmopolitan cities with people from all over. And it's just such a cool melting pot that London isn't just England. There's yeah. so much more to see out there. So definitely get out and explore the countryside because I'm serious, you go to York, you'll fall in love. You'll go to the- York is amazing. We loved York. Now I have so many more places I wanna to go to. Um, and haven't been much out in the countryside, mostly just been in the big cities in England. Uh, but yeah, uh, York was such a cool vibe, a cool experience, and I don't think it's to be missed. I'm so glad I listened to people's advice telling you you've got to go to York because we absolutely loved it there. London's cool too, but like he said, it isn't England. It's it's more than just, it's the capital. It's the largest city, but it's not representative of the rest of the country. Beach by Brighton, or see the cliffs of Dover, or, or or go to you know go to Cheshire, and all the kinds of cool places. You're gonna have a great time, but realize that look. England is not just London. Get out and explore this country. And kind of also going with that, remember, England is not Britain. They're two different kind of things. Britain makes up, you know, Scotland, Wales, England all together. So if you see people that are that are English, they're different than British overall. A Scotsman will be upset if you call them an Englishman, but will be probably okay if you say they're British, all yeah. right? So just, just know that one. Yeah, it, it, it gets tricky, but I think most people understand by now, you've got England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland. Britain is that one island that is England, Wales, Scotland. Uh, it was called Great Britain until they added Ireland for a while and it was the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And then of course, Ireland, uh, most of the island became uh, an independent republic and now it's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Well, don't, don't, don't mess up the British English with people around here, okay? Now the seventh thing I want to say, don't forget your P's and Q's, i.e. don't forget your politeness yeah. and knowing how to stand in the queue here. Because people in England are extremely polite, sometimes to a fault, like yes. I feel like I've said sorry enough, but I feel like I need to say sorry more. And you'll get sorry as if someone bumps. Yeah, my experience 100%. Now in, in general, I've actually found all the people I've met in various countries in Europe to be very friendly. Uh, but absolutely true in England. Uh, very, very polite. Uh, interesting thing that happened. I, I use Google Maps a lot in England, especially navigating public transportation. That's fantastic. Because like, say you're somewhere in London and you want to get, say I'm at my hotel near King's Cross and I want to go to the Tower of London. I put it in. It'll tell me exactly which trains I need to take on the underground, which platform to go to to get that train. Really easy to use. But occasionally there'd be a little like questions our first time there. And, and one of the natives would see us looking at our phone, trying to figure it out and would come over and offer, hey, do you need help? Is there something like you didn't have to ask anybody for help. People would see it look like we were confused and they would come over and offer to help us. It was such an amazing experience. Now, that said, people in England, if you're an American and you're used to like, you know, you're sitting on the train and you start making small talk. Most people in England don't like that. They kind of keep to themselves. They don't just kind of strike up conversations with strangers on the train, so to speak, like you might in other places. I'm sending you and stuff. They'll say, sorry, excuse me. You need to do the same thing. So when you come here, make sure you do bring your manners. That's why we all wish, oh, I wish my boys could grow up to be an English gentleman. Now, not everywhere are they English gentlemen. I mean, go to a pub late at night with beers going around, you'll be like, what, there's no English gentleman here. Yeah, there is that. But in general, manners are a very important thing here, so make sure you don't forget your manners, but also don't queue jump, i.e. don't butt yeah. line. They I mean, that's good advice anywhere, right? But it's a bigger deal there. Not like that here. They are very much, we have our line, you stay in your line, you do not mess with the I line. I love that. So get to the end of the line. 
So <laughs> just know that one because that's one thing I see. The, the he shows the post boxes there. So one thing you'll notice in London, there are no trash cans around for you to just throw your, your trash everywhere you go. And there's not public restrooms you can just go in and use. And a lot of times when you get down into other parts of England, you'll actually have to pay to use public restrooms. It's like 50p or something like that, like 50 cents, but not a big deal. The, the trash can thing I found out later was because of uh, some bombings that took place a decade or so ago. But the city's very, very clean. It's not like New York. You go to Manhattan and especially around trash days, there'll be piles of trash everywhere. It's not like that in London. Certain parts, yeah. You go to Whitechapel, it's a little dirtier in some areas. At least that's been my experience. And I'm sure other parts too. But the main touristy parts of London, very clean. They get most of the tourists where people get upset is the line budding and stuff because you know germany it's like a mad rush for a door or something like that here we'll wait in line it'll be fine let the people come out of the yeah. tube we'll go one of the two people get out of the train the people get in the train so you do have that so don't forget your manners okay your p's and q's don't forget those and the eighth thing you don't want to forget when you come here is a raincoat now i've been here and i've been very lucky this is my fourth day here yeah and i got really super lucky my our first time in the uk we were there for two weeks we saw rain for exactly 20 minutes the entire two weeks. And that was when my daughter and I went over to Whitechapel for the Jack the Ripper tour. And it rained for 20 minutes. We pulled out our umbrella, which I had been carrying around. And then we never saw rain again, even in Scotland for a week. Never saw it. Now, this last time I was there in, uh, what was it, end of January, had quite a bit of rain, but it was tolerable. And it would change quickly. Like it would rain for about 10 minutes and then the sun would come out. And then an hour later it would rain again, but it wasn't bad. And there's still no rain. So yes, it does happen that it doesn't rain here. It's not like it rains every day in England, okay? But I will say, if you are gonna come here, even in the summer, bring a light waterproof jacket, but more importantly, bring waterproof shoes, Agreed. because it's that's where you're really gonna get sounds. wet, because you can buy an umbrella for like five pounds, 10 pounds, no problem. So, but just don't forget that waterproof jacket because you will eventually need it, okay? I'm not gonna lie to you. When we were there with the family last summer, I carried around five ponchos in my backpack for two weeks and we never used them once. I think they're still in the package. I've been very lucky this time. I've been coming here for 20 years and this is one of the, this is probably the second time I've actually had like nice weather the whole time. So it's awesome when you have it, but it doesn't always happen. And the ninth don't I have for you is don't forget to go to the pub. This is definitely a pub culture 100%. place. Go and have your pint, enjoy the talking, the people, all kinds of stuff, and you will enjoy it. So I hope that helps you know what don't to do when you are here. Yeah, the, the pub, the local pub culture is so cool. It's one of my favorite things. You get a real sense of the community and things like that. Love, love, love that. Uh, another thing I'll add to that as well uh, is if you go in the summertime and it does get hot sometimes when you're there and even when it's not real hot, and this is true for Europe as a whole, air conditioning is not standard like it is in the States. Here in the States, I don't think I've ever been to a hotel that didn't have air conditioning. Not true in Europe. More often than not, I haven't. There's been only a couple times I've been in a hotel that had air conditioning. But unlike in the States, in hotels in Europe, you can usually open the window. Uh, and even in the winter, like when I went to Verdun in February of last year in France, I had my window open the entire time and I was still hot in my hotel room. So just be prepared for that. That's a thing. You'll probably have to sleep with the window open if it's warm at all. So that was cool. He does a great job with these. I highly recommend if you're traveling somewhere, if you want to kind of get the basics and you want to get a little bit of an overview, some things to expect. He does a great job with the videos that I've seen so far. They've definitely been very accurate to my experience. So I put the link in the description there if you want to check it out. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.